I want to let you in on a little secret. When I'm not traveling to Las Vegas or podcasting about Las Vegas or watching movies about Las Vegas, I like to read about Las Vegas. And over the last several years of doing this podcast, I've been fortunate enough to talk to some very cool authors who've written amazing books about the city, including its people and its history. I thought it might be fun to take a little trip down memory lane and reshare some of those conversations with you. Maybe even give you some ideas for titles to add to your own personal Las Vegas library. My name is Jeff, the host of Jeff Does Vegas, and this is a little something I like to call Vegas Book Club. This time around on Vegas Book Club, we're heading back to episode number 78 of the podcast and my conversation with David Schwartz, UNLV professor, Las Vegas historian, and author of the book, at the Sands. December 15th, 1972, saw the opening of one of the most iconic hotels in the history of Las Vegas, the Sands Hotel and Casino. During its heyday, it played host to some of the biggest names in entertainment, most notably the legendary Rat Pack, featuring Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and Sammy Davis Jr. And although that might be what the Sands is best known for, there's way more to the story than that. David and I talked about what inspired him to write a book on the Sands, how mobbed up the hotel was compared to other Vegas hotels of that era, Frank Sinatra's involvement in the project, and what led to the eventual downfall of the property, both figuratively and literally. Please enjoy my conversation with David Schwartz. I think it all comes from growing up in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and I grew up at just this age where they were imploding, blowing up the old hotels on the boardwalk and building casinos. This was right when they legalized casinos. So it always seemed kind of exciting to me and this interesting, you know, I looked at gambling and casinos as this force that could blow things up. And wondered, you know, why would that, you know, why did they have to do it this way? And when I was a kid, I said, well, why do they have to build casinos? Well, they have to do it because it's more honest that way. Right. And then when I went to graduate school, I had the idea of writing a dissertation about the historical development of casinos. And that's pretty much everything has come from that. And you've worked in casinos as well. Yes. Yeah, mostly security and surveillance. I also had a stint as Mr. Peanut, not working directly for the Tropicana, but the Peanut Shop, which was on the ground floor of Tropicana. I think now it's called Boardwalk Treats. This is the Tropicana Atlantic City, not um, Las Vegas. I think now the that space is called Boardwalk Treats, and it's pretty much the same, but it was a pretty awesome job. It's funny that you bring up the whole Mr. Peanut thing, because... Um... I read that in your bio and I wondered if it was a real thing or if it was just something you put in there to see if people would read all the way to the end of the bio. And, and it is a real thing. It's a real thing. I definitely would put on the shell again, you know, definitely. I enjoyed it. And it's also kind of funny. It goes back to the start of my career. When I first started out, what a senior colleague said, you know, you shouldn't tell people that you did that. Cause I would, I think they sat in one of my classes and I said, yeah, I've been working in hospitality for a long time. I was Mr. Peanut. You shouldn't tell them that because people won't take you seriously. I'm like, well, if somebody doesn't take you seriously because you worked a job, you know, as a teenager, <laughs> you're doing that. I like, I don't want them to take me seriously. That's not. So I kind of just do it just to, I don't know, stick that in there. Yeah. Cause I mean, nobody, you know, like nobody is, uh, you know, I'm just a guy from South Jersey. It's not like I can say I have some great pedigree or something. So why not be honest? <laughs> uh, Give it the choice between working Mr. Peanut or working casino security. Which would you pick? Mr. Peanut over surveillance for sure. You know, surveillance, you're, you're stuck in a room. It's interesting because it's, it kind of goes back to whether you want to know things or you want to do things. Some people I think like to know, would like to know everything happening where you know, in surveillance, you do get, do get to see everything going on. I found it frustrating because I couldn't do anything because I would just want to get down there on the floor. So definitely I preferred, I've, I've learned that I prefer being out on the floor and that's not going to be true for everybody. Uh-huh. You know, it is the thing about working on the floor in a casino or as Mr. Peanut or whatever is that some days, you know, you might get kicked in the nuts other days, somebody would give you a hundred dollar tip just because they're having a good day. I mean, you never, you never know what's going to happen. Whereas when you're in the, you know, 
the back of the house, it's a lot more predictable. I love it. Um, Dave, we've got you here today not to talk about your long storied career as Mr. Peanut, however, but to chat about your latest book titled At the Sands, you are taking a look at a very iconic, very legendary Las Vegas hotel and property with a, a, a ton of history here. Um, what inspired you to to take a deep dive into the history of the sands it was exactly that iconic status you know i'd written roll the bones which was a history of gambling from the dawn of time to today you know i'd written grandissimo which was jay sarno who built caesar's palace and circus circus and i wanted to do i wanted to do a book where i focused on one casino and Looking around, if you look at the classic casinos of eight, and I wanted to be, I wanted it to be one that was closed, so it had an end, you know, so it had an ending. So I said, well, what are some of the casinos? And Sands jumped out at me because that's the one that people talk about. When people talk about Old Vegas, they they really talk about the Sands, and that's not to take anything away from the Dunes or the Desert Inn or any of the other places, but the Sands seems to be like the place that people want to talk about. And in going through this book, I mean, there is a ton of of detail in here, lots of absolutely amazing stories. Um, what kind of a timeline are we looking at for for putting together this book from the time you started working on it to the time of release here? It took me, I think, two years. Wow. Total. A lot of research and then about a year or so of serious writing, you know, that I'm doing on the side while I'm working my main gig. So it kind of came, you know, there was month after month after month where nothing happened then it was just like boom rapid fire progress so it took a while i would say about two years and i would imagine the the process of actually gathering all the research for this is quite arduous Uh, i mean to a, a smaller degree i've put together a few podcast episodes about vegas history and one of the things that I've often run into is is differences in dates and inconsistencies in stories and 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 things like that. I, I I can't even imagine trying to do it for a project like this. How do you correlate that information to make sure what you're getting out is is accurate? I think most of the times, the closer you get to the source, the more accurate it will be. So I'll give you a really good example of this. This is Carl Cohen who came to the Sands in 1953, fall of 1953, as the casino manager. He had come over from the El Rancho Vegas. Now, if you just Google Carl Cohen, Sands, El Rancho Vegas, you'll find a story online saying that in 1955, he got into a fight with Belgian Cattleman, who was the owner, over Howard Hughes gambling there. Howard Hughes was dressed kind of shabbily. Cattleman wanted to throw him out, and Cohen said no, and they literally got into a fist fight. And it's one of those stories that seems like too good to be true and like, Hmm. So I did some research into the, into the publications at the time and nobody in 1955 mentioned any kind of disturbance in the El Rancho Vegas in that period. Like it just wasn't mentioned. Howard Hughes was in Vegas. You know, I can't prove that he was not in Vegas in 55. Although in that period, he was usually staying at the Flamingo although he certainly could have gone down to the El Rancho Vegas to gamble. So it's possible that he was there. But what did it for me was the fact that Carl Cohen left the El Rancho Vegas in 1953. And I was able to piece this together using Fabulous Las Vegas, which was a magazine, a a weekly magazine back then. Basically what the timeline was, was Cohen went on a vacation because Vegas was such a small town then. They would literally put in there if a craps dealer and his wife went on vacation, that would be a news item. Right. We're like, hey, welcome back. They're coming back. So first thing was said, well, he was on vacation. He went down to LA. He comes back. And like a week later, he is now associated with the Sands. And there were a couple, there were a couple of interesting moving parts going on. And this is something that I, you know, some of this made it into the book. Some of this I didn't put into print because it's not, it's just hunches. So he's doing that. Meanwhile, Jake Friedman, who is the on paper owner of the place, is negotiating for another loan to add another 200 rooms. And he's going around the country doing that. He gets the loan. Carl Cohen, in a totally separate announcement, comes aboard as casino manager. I think that he went to someone, I think it probably was a guy named Joseph Doc Stacher, who was one of the 
big people, one of the big investors and got the money and that Cohen becoming the manager was one of the conditions that they wanted to keep him and he wanted to watch his interest. And that's how Cohen got in. That's just a hunch. I have no proof of that, but it seems like the timing is very coincidental that he'd been, because Friedman had on paper, at least been trying to get this loan since the sands open for, for almost a year. And then it happens and he is new casino manager like that week, that seemed a little bit interesting. And there's nothing about Howard Hughes connected with that. And it would have been big news because Howard Hughes was mentioned when he came to town. Uh-huh. So, so something like that would have been new, big news. So hopefully I debunk that a little bit. And I would imagine that that's got to be one of the hardest parts of writing a book like this. Uh, I've spoken with Jeff Schumacher from the Mob Museum a couple of times on a couple of different Vegas history related topics. And, and from what he's told me, there are so many different urban legends associated with all these different Vegas resorts and, and Las Vegas in general, that I would think one of the most difficult parts of this had to have been sorting through the bullshit, so to speak. It was. And what complicates it is that in casinos, they didn't write everything down. So it's not like if somebody says, well, there's a hidden investment investor in the Coca-Cola corporation in 1950, you could disprove that. Say, well, here we have the stockholders and everything. Obviously, I can't tell you, well, yeah, all the people who are in paper as being owners of the Sands, that was the only owners. There were no hidden interests. That would be foolish. You know, on the other hand, yes, we know that there's something going on with that, but some of this stuff is just a little bit too outrageous to take it at face value. And, you know, I can never really, I can't disprove that Cohen got into a fight with Belden Cattleman, which I, again, I don't believe because Cohen was not the kind of man who you would get into a fight with willingly, Mm -hmm. you know, and I just can't see a casino owner being beaten in front of all his employees. (laughs) Um, Going all the way back to the, the, the Genesis of the sands, if you will, way back to the beginning, I, I guess, I mean, I always sort of knew how small of a world Vegas was, but I guess at the same time, I really didn't know how small of a world it was until I read this book. I had no idea that Billy Wilkerson, who of course some may recognize uh, the name from the history of the Flamingo and, and his involvement there and having it stolen out from under him by, by Bugsy Siegel. I had no idea that he had any involvement way back at the beginning with what was essentially the birth of what would eventually become the sands to be honest, neither did I, because it's not very well publicized. The reason we know Wilkerson was so involved with the flamingo was that his son wrote a book about him and talked about that and didn't really didn't talk about the sands thing at all because that just wasn't part of the story. Um, But it definitely did happen. He was, you know, written again, this is why you go back to the original sources. He's in there. People are talking about him being involved. It was going to, it was called LaRue. It was a little, cafe, restaurant, nightclub that opened up and casino that opened up uh, where the Sands is. And he was very involved with it. He then pulled out of it, got married and washed his hands of it. And then the whole thing closed a couple months later. Mm. And then they built the Sands. Originally, the Sands was just going to be an, an enlargement of LaRue. And they later called it the Sands. And I guess the next question then would be um, organized crime was very rampant in las vegas at that time um i mean late 40s early 50s mid 50s they they were everywhere they had fingers and pies all over the city so to speak um compared to the other properties how mobbed up was the sands well i think they were all pretty much mobbed up you know and it was nothing sinister i think it was just this was where you went to get the money And these are the people who knew how to operate it. So if you wanted to run your casino, you would have to get an Eddie Levinson or Carl Cohen. And that's who they worked with. And it's not, you know, and it's also not saying that everybody here is a mafioso, you know, something out of the Sopranos. It's like, these were casino guys. That's, that was their business. They worked with the mob because that was who was running it. That's who they're working for. And that's kind of where it comes from. So it kind of wasn't, you know, just like today, people don't make a big deal about corporations owning casinos. I think it was the same thing back then. It was just understood. Of course, it was illegal, but it was it was understood. Well, and the Sands didn't really have that same sort of nefarious reputation that, say, the Flamingo did with, um, I mean, it was very just commonly 
known and it is very commonly known now that, yeah, the mob was all over the Flamingo. Bugsy built the place or so the legend goes. But the Sands just, as I say, didn't have that same reputation. I think a lot of it was being more discreet about it. You know, there are also places like the Thunderbird that had a direct link to the Lansky brothers. I think the Sands was able to keep that distance. And it's interesting because the first person who would have built the Sands, Matt Kofferman, who was originally running the project, was too close to Doc Stacher, that that one mob guy. And they said, no, you can't do it. You're too close to him. And they wouldn't let him do it. So Jake Friedman stepped in to be the president, at least on paper, be the majority owner. So that's interesting how that goes, where he was a little bit too close. They needed a little bit more reserve. But then maybe through Cohen, Stacher becomes very strongly affiliated with it again in about a year. And if I'm recalling correctly from the book, they had a hell of a time even getting licensed in the beginning, did they not? I mean, it, this was a really strange time of what was happening in in Vegas and in the world. Uh, the big thing or one of the big things going on was the, the Kefauver hearings into organized crime. They were happening right around the same time, were they not? Yeah, it's interesting. You have a lot of stuff going on in this period. You've got Kefauver, you've got the atomic testing starting, and then you have the SANS opening. So they kind of, it's interesting how we have the federal government coming in here in a lot of different ways and how that was perceived. And you did, you know, they were definitely leery of the federal government coming in. So somebody who was best friends with Doc Stacher, that's not good. You know, somebody who might who worked for Frank Costello, that's okay because none of that none of that is proven. And that that would be Jack and Trotter, who had worked for Frank Costello in New York. But the idea was keeping it respectable looking. Right. <laughs> well, and then Trotter would have done that as well with with his connections through the Copacabana in New York and, and mm -hmm. coming to Vegas. I mean, he, he was a mover shaker. He knew, he knew people that was kind of his, his big thing. Was it not? Yeah. And again, when you have Lucille Ball showing up and all these other major stars, Humphrey Bogart, who are you? You don't want to be, want to be the one who say, Oh, these people are the mob. It's like, well, it's exciting. And they're bringing a lot of celebrities and everybody seems to be endorsing it. So I think that's was really the strategy there. And I mean, the Sands is really known, they're known as the home of the Rat Pack. I mean, this was, everybody's seen that iconic picture of the Rat Pack standing in front of the marquee with their names on it and everything like that. When did Frank Sinatra step into the picture with the Sands? Frank Sinatra steps in in October 1953. And it's really interesting because he was up for the part in On the Waterfront that Marlon Brando got and won an Oscar for. He was up for that. And of course he was from Hoboken. He felt like it was his birthright to get the part. The producers disagreed, hired Brando. The rest is history. Right. But, <laughs> um, and I don't think he ever forgave Brando for that, which is why if you watch guys and dolls, they didn't really get along on yeah. set. <laughs> he, he almost didn't do the Sands gig because he, and it was, again, this was reported on the papers. He said, well, you know, if I get, called upon to do on the waterfront, I'm going to skip this engagement. But it was a very carefully negotiated thing. Even before he played, he was negotiating to buy a piece of the sands. And again, people have speculated that he was actually holding that interest for somebody else. Again, that's kind of, we could speculate about that all day. You know, on paper, he was the owner and he certainly acted like he owned the place. I'll put it that way. <laughs> he definitely acted like he owned the place. So when did the, the other members of the Rat Pack start showing up at the sands? So it happened over several years. Uh, Dean Martin first shows up in 1955 with Jerry Lewis. So first as part of that duo, then after they split, he, I guess, in the custody, he kept the sands. I guess Jerry went somewhere else, but he <laughs> kept custody of the sands. So he became a fixture there. Sammy Davis Jr. starts playing in 1957 with the Will Maston Trio, which by that point, pretty much his uncle and father would come out for one song and the rest of the show would be all Sammy, but because he felt loyal to them, it was billed as the Will Maston Trio. So he starts in 57. 1960, when they're shooting Ocean's Eleven, Al Freeman, who was a publicity director of the Sands and really one of the heroes of Las Vegas publicity, gets the idea to, hey, let's put all three of them on stage together and we can bill them all together and have Joey Bishop and Peter Lawford show up too. That And Joey Bishop was sort of the 
ringmaster, I guess, you know, his job was to get everybody out to end the show on time to get the gamblers back out on the floor. <laughs> Cause you know, Frank and Dean and Sammy would have gone all night, but his job was to vote. Okay. We're just shut it down, drop the curtain, get them out there. Mm -hmm. I recently did an episode about live music recorded in, in Vegas, just because being Canadian, I can't get down to Vegas and I'm really <laughs> missing that live entertainment. And one of the albums I came across, one of the live albums was the Rat Pack live at the Sands. And listening to that it just you can just you feel like you're sitting in the copa room and it's just like that's vegas that's what it's all about yeah you know the humor is definitely a bit dated at this point yes <laughs> levels <laughs> but yeah you can feel that you can really feel that um another recording i would suggest is sinatra at the sands with count basie from 66 it's really good not least of which, because at one point he says, anybody want a casino by the lake, which is when he was trying to sell his interest in the Cal Neva, which I talk about later on in the book. But that's another really good one because you have Count Basie and then Sinatra. So th those are both re two really good ones. You mentioned Sammy Davis Jr. Um, performing at the Sands and something that I did want to talk about that I thought was really interesting. The Sands did a lot for, at the time, racial equality among the performers in Las Vegas. I mean, at that point... Vegas was still quite heavily segregated and a lot of the African-American performers were not, they weren't allowed to, to perform on the strip. They weren't even allowed to enter some of the, the strip hotels and casinos and having Sammy Davis Jr. There really kind of opened that up. It did. It's interesting. And one other thing that I found, I think it was in 1958, there was a news story about Sammy Davis Jr. walking around the casino floor with Carl Cohen and Carl Cohen telling him, don't run over time, get them out here quicker. And I found that interesting because, and it was a story that pretty much, even though Al Freeman's name wasn't in the byline, I have the original release that he sent out and they ran it verbatim. So um, pretty much I found it interesting that they wanted to publicize that not only is Sammy Davis Jr. here, he's on the casino floor. Mm -hmm. which was a rarity in 1958 in Las Vegas. Most of the black performers, they did not let them mix with the guests on the floor afterwards, or they would extremely limit it, you know? Um, and it's interesting. If you watch the movie, uh, Meet Me in Las Vegas, which was set at the Sands, Lena Horne is seen singing on stage, but not on the casino floor. Mm -hmm. Sammy Davis Jr. is in that he's a cameo and he's literally just a voiceover. I guess they couldn't get a camera there that day, but it's interesting <laughs> that they present Lena Horne and she's wearing this beautiful gown and it's very elegant, but she's on stage and not in the casino. Three years later, that's different where Sammy Davis Jr. is publicized walking around the casino. As I say, it was really fascinating to kind of read into that and see how they, and if I'm not mistaken, I think Sammy Davis Jr. actually kind of stepped up and said like, listen, if you don't make these changes, I'm out of here. He was one of the people who did, you know, and definitely the local NAACP had probably the biggest part of that where they threatened to have a boycott on the strip and do a protest march in the strip. And that was why in March of 1960, casino owners said, we'll desegregate. But definitely Sammy helped, helped them get there for sure. Yeah, I just I just thought it was really, really interesting to see what an impact this this casino hotel, this quote unquote place in the sun had on on the whole situation of of uh racial inequity and and uh segregation and desegregation i just thought it was it was really really fascinating um another very fascinating person that i want to talk about is howard hughes who is i mean he's such a character when it comes to the history of of las vegas he kind of went on this weird buying spree of hotels in where he bought up. I mean, desert Inn, of course, where he mm -hmm. took over the top two floors and said, okay, well, I'm not leaving. I'm just going to buy the place. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, castaways and landmark and the new frontier and all this kind of stuff. What spurred him on to buy the sands? Okay. So here's another thing where we have a couple different stories floating around the, you know, the one story is Howard Hughes bought all those casinos to chase the mob out of Las Vegas. The other story is the mob took advantage of Howard Hughes to get him to buy the casinos, whatever, whatever. You know, it's f according to Bob Mayhew, who was Howard Hughes's right-hand man, who was literally the face of Hughes, Nevada, 
They did it because Hughes had a ton of money from selling his stake in TWA that was going to be taxed, and he wanted to get it into active income. So he said, just buy everything you can. And it wasn't like he had a, he doesn't seem to really have had any kind of strategic vision. It was just buy everything. Let's park the money in there so we don't get taxed. Right. But I mean, he did have a lot of ideas of what he wanted to do with the sands. I mean, Hughes was a, a, a visionary and, and, and was a, a, a big ideas guy in general, but, but he certainly had big ideas for the sands. Yeah. And it's interesting because he does this right when Kirk Kerkorian announces the international, which was going to be 1500 rooms, world's biggest hotel, Okay, as soon as he do- announces that and is looking for funding, Hughes says, but wait, I'm building a 4,000-room expansion to the Sands. And I looked at, he he announced it in a handwritten press release. And he's saying, you know, we're inventing this technology. He has something that sounds kind of like it was kind of like Top Golf, where people will play golf, but not on the golf course. And he has all this other technology. He says, well, it hasn't been invented yet, so I can't tell you about it, but I'm designing it. And it was absolutely just wild. And people took it so seriously that the school board actually said, well, we're going to have to issue some bonds to build schools for the children of the people who are going to work here because we're going to be adding hundreds of jobs and they're going to be bringing kids. So it got down to where they were trying to line up financing for it. And of course it never happened, which is a funny thing, but basically anything he said, people took that seriously. A 4,000 room hotel at that point in, in history and and all the other things. I mean, really that sounds, it sounds like the ramblings of a crazy person. Yeah. And it was a 24 hour shopping mall. Now it's all things that did happen 30 years later. Yeah. 25 years later, it's kind of interesting. So it's all stuff that did happen. It just didn't happen there and he didn't do it. And he, you know, I don't, my theory is that he never intended to do it is that he just wanted to, you know, take some of the oxygen away from Kirk Kerkorian. Mm -hmm. I have another conspiracy theory. If you want to hear it about Kerkorian and Hughes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So basically Kerkorian in 1970 was trying to get, I think, do another offering for international leisure. And the SEC said, well, you have to give us audited books going back five years at your properties. One of them was the international. That was fine. The other was the Flamingo. Five years took it back to 1965, which was before he bought it in 67, which is when the friends of Meyer Lansky owned it. And they didn't have audited books. (laughs) So basically, through no fault of Kerkorian's, he wasn't able to do this. And this was one of the reasons, this is actually the big reason why he sold the international to Hilton. Mm -hmm. Because he wasn't able to get that second round of financing. My conspiracy theory is, is that Hughes, who was a huge donor to both Johnson and Nixon, was able to pull some strings and get some pressure put on in the SEC to make them do that. And that's just a wild conspiracy theory. But that seems, yeah, I don't know. I think there might be something there. It seems somewhat reasonable. And I mean, Kerkorian was a huge, a a massive influence in Las Vegas with all the other properties that he was involved with as well. So. As I say, Vegas is such a small world when it comes to this stuff, whether it's the 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 Kirk Kikorians or the or the Steve Wins of the world or or whoever, like these guys just sort of this is where they land and this is this is this is it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think I think that definitely shows how small the town was back then. One of the more interesting things that I found too with Howard Hughes being involved with the Sands was uh him and Frank Sinatra did not get along. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they both were rivals for Ava Gardner. Of course, Ava broke Frank's heart. You know, Frank in those days was very liberal. Um, he was, some people accused him of being a communist, you know, even in the sixties, of course, in the seventies, he's um, on Nixon's, you know, plugging for Nixon. In the eighties, he was great friends with Nancy Reagan. I mean, to the extent that people said they were having an affair. Um, <laughs> and there's this great picture somewhere of Nancy dancing with Frank and Ronald Reagan is just looking like, Oh my God, <laughs> it's a great picture. I don't, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so they didn't like, and of course Hughes was ultra conservative. So he basically sees Sinatra as this lefty pinko, Just everything he despises, you know, Sinatra, of course, has no use for Hughes and 
things come to a head in the sands over credit. You know, I go into this in great detail in the book. I won't spoil the whole story, but basically the upshot of it is Carl Cohen punches Frank Sinatra in the face, chips two of his teeth. And what surprises me is that this was a national news story Mm -hmm. where literally I have a clipping from a newspaper in New Hampshire Frank Sinatra, you know, punched by casino manager and people, you know, somebody bought Carl Cohen a boxing robe, you know, people (laughs) were just also another kind of lesson here is that Sinatra and the media had not gotten along. You know, he had punched one columnist, (laughs) he he always is fighting with the media and they just got their knives out. They just got their knives out. It was great. I mean, the lead of the story was seeing, and this is Don DeGilio, who was the columnist for the review journal hit don's lead was singer tony bennett left his heart in san francisco but frank sinatra left his teeth at least two of them in las vegas that was the lead. <laughs> and, it was like, and it just went on so they just relished the opportunity to jump to, to jump on him that's amazing I, I and as you said i mean frank really kind of walked around he walked around the sands like he owned the place and and i mean for the longest time he basically he did kind of own it and with hughes step again and saying no 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 No, that's not how this is going to go. And nobody, you know, even earlier, so three years, four years before that, he'd lost his license. And I go into this book in in the book in great detail. And nobody from the Sands makes any effort to help him. And there's even an FBI informant said, and this was in Carl Cohen's FBI file, says like, well, yeah, there's a meeting of the Sands people. And he said, we're not going to help him. You know, he got into that himself. So it's kind of amazing. He, and, you know, I did find going through the Sands collection at UNLV, some memos going back and forth where for one of Frank Sinatra's singles releases, they had a contest with DJs around the country where the grand prize was going to be a trip to Las Vegas and the Sands. And the San, Al Freeman from the Sands was saying, hey, you didn't consult us about this. This is a busy weekend. What are you doing? And Frank's guy says, well, you know, we're paying for the airplane ticket. Frank himself is paying for the posters and the, and the stations. All you're paying, all you're doing is the hotel room and the food. So Frank is also very much in favor of this. So you could tell, and just the passive aggressive memos going back and forth, you could see there was not, he was not universally loved at the Sands. But I guess they had that relationship where they realized that they must have had this relationship where they realized that he was good for them and they were good for him. So you just they they just kind of put up with each other to a certain degree, I'm assuming. Yeah. You know, and again, today it's a lot different, but it would be like, well, I guess she's not playing at Caesars anymore. But if obviously you'd want to keep Celine Dion very happy when she was at Caesars and you wouldn't want to do anything, you know, but I think they're all a little bit more respectful and, I'm, and the, mo- the money is a lot bigger now mm. where they, you wouldn't have this kind of thing going on, but definitely he had that power. He definitely had that power. Looking at the, the later years of the Sands, I mean, what really kind of led to the downfall of the Sands? Was it just a case of the, all these giant mega resorts are starting to go up, up and down the strip and around around what was essentially a very small hotel, were they just not able to compete with that? Okay. They could have gone the route of the Flamingo and just basically gutted everything and built huge towers. And you would, it would still be the sands, but kind of the sands and name only just like the Flamingo. It's the Flamingo, Mm -hmm. but it's not the place where Ben Siegel and Billy Wilkerson, you know, did their thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, they could have gone that way. They didn't because just of the way the ownership changed where, Kerkorian buys it and then Adelson buys it. And just as Adelson's buying it, you have these, this other, the 1993 wave of mega resorts is being built. So people say, well, we don't know if we want to fund a lot of stuff. And originally they talked about adding another, another 2000 rooms. And then by the time the 1993 ones are in the rear view mirror and everything's looking good, it's like, Hey, this could be so profitable just level the place and build something new. And that's how you get the Venetian. So basically they missed that. If they had started doing this in the eighties, like the Flamingo did, probably it might still be around. But again, I would say it would be a name only kind of like the Riviera was at the end or the other places. Whereas they just kind of missed that. And they said, no, we'll do, we'll do it again. But even if they had, if you look at places like the Stardust, which expanded in the eighties, that didn't save them in the two thousands or the frontier. Mm-hmm. So it wouldn't, I mean, it wouldn't, they might have gotten imploded. 
early 1990s, which early 1990s, which hotels would those have been going up around the sands? It was the, so the 93, yeah, the 93 class. So Mirage was 89. Then you have, have Excalibur after that. Then you've got MGM Grand, Treasure Island, and Luxor. And then Mirage is kind of in the boom after that, a little bit before Venetian. But, you know, so by 95, you're like, eh, it's probably not going to pencil out just to add more towers here. Yeah. Probably want to do something bigger to compete because honestly, there you can see in the pictures, and there's a great picture in the book where you can see Treasure Island sort of next to it, and you're like, oh yeah, how how could they compete with that? Well, and as as you say, I mean, how many rooms were in the the sands by the end? Seven hundred and seventy-seven. So when you're lucky, lucky triple seven. So when <laughs> yeah. you're when you're seven hundred and seventy-seven rooms competing with, and you're on a strip competing with resorts that are. 2,500, 3,000, 4,000 rooms. I mean, that, that's, as you say, there's, there's no way that you could even come close to competing with that. Yeah. And just newer, you know, they don't, they're not going to be getting a lot of high rollers at that point. They're going to be going to Caesars or the, or the Mirage and you can't really, you know, it's not big enough like the Riviera where we'll just expand it or the Flamingo. We'll just get the mass volume to, to stay viable. So they really kind of like the desert in a couple of years later, we're in a rough position. So I guess the the big question then is, why do you think the Sands has maintained this legendary, iconic status for for all these years, and and this level of nostalgia where people just, yeah, that's that's what Vegas should be. Why, why do you think they've they've held on to that? I think a lot of it is because it's not there anymore. You know. You could look at, you know, let's say Bobby Darren at the Flamingo was another famous Vegas record. You know, it doesn't have that same mystique as the Rat Pack at the Sands. You know, not because Bobby Darren's not talented, but because, yeah, we could, you know, $39 a night to stay at the Flamingo now or whatever it is. It doesn't have that same mystique, whereas the Sands, you know, we'll never go to the Sands again. You have that. It's part of the, it's definitely part of the past. So I think them closing it in 96 really fueled that enigma, that iconic status of it. I think if it was still around, you wouldn't have it because we don't have it around the Tropicana. We don't have it around the Riviera. I mean, Caesar's Palace, we do, but Caesar's Palace is something totally different. Mm -hmm. And even that is very different from what it was. Well, and I feel like to a certain degree too, that icon status, people hold on to that with, as you say, with things that go away and defunct things. I mean, a perfect example is if Pan Am Airlines, as, mm -hmm. as an example, people always hearken back to that, the days of when everybody wore tuxedos to fly places and there was somebody mm -hmm. rolling a, a cart with prime ribbon lobster down the middle of the aisle. And now it's peanuts. And if you want to put your seatbelt on, it's going to cost you an extra $11. Yeah. All of these, these things, I, I guess there's a certain level of just that nostalgia with, with the sands. There is because we can, we can never go back to it now. So I think that seals it and we just can look back at it and say, well, and of course we don't also remember all the bad stuff, you know, in addition to all the great stuff, there's a lot of also bad stuff that happened, but we don't think about that anymore. But it seems for some reason that the sands, even more so than any of those other somewhat iconic hotels like the Stardust or the Riviera or the Dunes or, or any of those, for some reason, the Sands is the one that really sticks out in people's minds. Yeah. I mean, I think that's true. And I think, again, it speaks to the publicity that Al Freeman did all those years ago, and then sort of getting lucky to have Frank Sinatra involved and be part of that, you know, and I think a lot of it also goes back to the nineties and that revival around swingers, where that's that's sort of what's going out there. Even Star Trek Deep Space Nine has the episodes in the holodeck with Vic Fontaine, and that's clearly based on the sands. You know, they never name the casino, but it's supposed to be something like the sands. And I think that, you know, the fact that you have that nostalgia in the 90s, right around the time that the sands goes away, really locks it in. Well, Dave, uh, congratulations uh, once again on the book, At the Sands, the casino that shaped classic Las Vegas, brought the Rat Pack together and went out with a bang. It is available online on all your favorite bookselling websites, along with your other books, uh, one of which I'm absolutely going to jump on and order right away, uh, Grandissimo, which you wrote about Jay Sarno, 
who, of course, was responsible for building Caesar's Palace. And he had some even bigger ideas for even bigger resorts as well. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's an interesting one. I think if somebody was going to check out another one of my books, that's the one I would recommend because that has a beginning, a middle and an end. You know, Sarno dies. It's the end of the book. And he really was was one of the interesting characters. So, yeah, that's I, I appreciate that a lot, Jeff. I really do. Awesome. Dave, thanks again so much for uh, for jumping on and chatting today. I really do appreciate it. Thank you.